Today is hopefully going to be extremely practical and helpful for you. I know that it will. And I know the guests that we have today are going to uh, be absolutely clear in how they can help you and what their experience has been. And so um, today is going to be recorded. And so everyone that's registered today is going to be able to get a link of what we've done today and uh, you can use for later on with your church teams over the next coming weeks. Um, preaching in an online world, um, it's going to be, it's a, been a crazy time and we do think that online world is going to be staying this way for a long, long time, even after the coronavirus uh, moves on from today. So we just know that it's going to be uh, beneficial to you and your church. Um, today, I just want to introduce you to our speakers. Um, first of all, we have James McPherson with us. He is Vice President of Alpha Crucis uh, globally. He's got great experience with leading some of the largest churches and congregations here in Australia. He has a huge online presence in both Twitter and Instagram and is regularly preaching around the world, communicating around the world. So he's going to have heaps to contribute today. We've got Beck Redden with us. And uh, Beck is a great leader here in South Australia. She leads a phenomenal church. She has got extensive broadcasting background. She's been blogging for years and has a really great ability to be able to communicate to people of all different levels. So we're excited to have her with us. We've got her husband, Don, with us as well. Don is a missional entrepreneur. Uh, he leads a church called City Life with his wife, Beck. He's been in broadcasting for many years and one of the broadcasting um, experience that he's had has led to 5 million listeners around the country and around the world. So he's going to have a great ability to be able to share with you about communicating to a screen that might be different to some other people. And it was actually one of his things that he popped up for this idea of just going, hey guys, if you don't know how to preach to a screen, uh, let me help you. And so I know that's going to be great. And we've got Josh Greenwood with us. He is lead pastor of Influencers Australia, one of the largest churches here. And they've just done an absolutely incredible job of moving completely online in amongst this virus. And uh, Josh's leadership has been paramount in that. So to be able to move thousands of people from one week to all online the next week is an incredible feat. And he's going to share about how they're pastoring and, and leading through this time. And I know he's doing a great job because my father-in-law goes to influencers. He's 68 years old didn't have anything to do with computers or Zoom or anything, leads a connect group. And uh, in the space of a week, he managed to set up his MBN, get a laptop, look out for Zoom, run his connect group, all that. So if he can get someone that's not tech savvy, like my father-in-law to do that in a week, I'm sure he's going to be able to help all of us. Um, so right now, I'm going to hand over to James McPherson. He's going to lead the, con the conversation with these guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I've had a look at who's online, and uh, some of you I know, some of you I don't. A special shout out to Dave Quilty, who's watching from Mount Isa in far western Queensland. So we've got people from all over, and hopefully uh, this will be an informative time. Um, what I really wanted to do to begin was to ask Josh and Don, um, how is preaching in an online world different to what we had been doing where you're preaching just to a congregation right there in front of you? What are the key adjustments that you've had to make in terms of your communication style and delivery? I might start with Josh Greenwood first. Josh, are you there? Oh, good to be with you all. And, uh, to have James asking questions. James is the prince of preachers, and I think this should all be just reversed and we ask James questions, but uh, this is how it is, and uh, we'd love to help give some of those uh, answers and what we've done. Um, I guess when it comes to style, look, when what's changed? A lot, uh, <laughs> nearly everything. Um, for a bit of quick context, and Matt alluded to it, uh, for how we're doing this season, is we're filming our services and we're pre-filming them during the week, um, like a lot of churches are. We've actually got our entire church, or as many as we can, onto Zoom. So every Sunday, we're not just watching a service, we're seeing one another, we're praying with one another, we're taking communion together, we're 
we're, we're seeing the church while watching the church. And that's one of the tensions we've had to create where we've wanted to obviously be able to allow people to see worship and participate in worship, hear the word. But we think it's so essential to see one another and pray for one another. So I guess a lot of people that are taking in our services may not be taking it in via a plasma. They often are taking it in through a laptop or some that can send it to their plasma or whatever it is are doing so. So very quickly, I realized for me in our scenario, the mannerisms of standing and I'm, I'm an energetic speaker. I'm quite passionate. I move quite a lot. It doesn't work as well when you're taking a service through a zoom screen. So as far as stylistically, I had to adjust. I did week one standing, talking, moving like I normally would, and then realized this isn't going to work in this season. So for me quite quickly, I've had to get on a stool, and look down the barrel of a camera and talk and create intimacy with the people that are watching because they don't get to see all of me because I'm in such a small space for them. And as that continued, I quickly realized, okay, I created intimacy, but now I had to adjust and create emotion. And now once I created emotion, I went shivers. I've got to add more. I've got to have the right hand movement. And so stylistically, I've had to now adjust how people are receiving my message where before I could move and connect with a wide audience that's in the room. Now I have to concentrate so much more on the individual that's watching me in a small screen, like maybe you're watching right now. And that's when I had to adjust stylistically enormously. I'll, I'll, there's a lot of okay, that I'll pause. Can I, can I just take up one thing? You've said a lot of things that I, I want to explore. And I'll come to Don and Beck in a moment, but talk to me about creating intimacy through the camera because I think you're quite right. Uh, watching someone preach on a screen can be quite dry. How, what are the techniques you've used to try to connect personally with people who are not in the room, but watching on their iPhone or on their laptop? Uh, how do you create intimacy like that? Okay, a few things, if I can. So like I went from week one standing to week one on a stool and I realized, okay, I was talking, but I, I wasn't connecting as I wanted with the person on the other side. So to be honest, my first week of doing this, I stuck photos of people that are actually going through hard times and people I loved underneath my camera because I needed to picture the individual I was talking to. Where I'm preaching, I'm reaching such a wide audience. Now I'm trying to think about the individual. Little things from week one where I would stand, sit pretty still and talk to just the ability to lean into where the camera is. So in moments where I'm trying to create faith and connection, normally I'd be walking and getting a bit excited, but I'm having to do it with my fingers and God's about to move. And it's just these little things that all are, what I'm trying to do is get the person that's leaning back on their couch to lean into the edge of their couch as I'm talking. So I find as I lean in, I'm, believe, I'm hoping, they're leaning in as I'm doing this. They're starting to go, oh, what's God saying? I'm just changing the tone of my voice. And I'm constantly trying to think my message is important, but the person, not just the congregation, the person I'm speaking to is most important. What would Jesus say in this moment if I had one opportunity to speak to them? So just my mannerisms. And then I noticed my, because I wasn't walking, I'm a walker when I preach often. So my, this hand was on the table, but my left hand, my, my left hand, it was moving like crazy and it was rubbing my leg and it was touching my face and I had to learn to control that and now bring and draw people in. And you know what the great, the worst part about this season and the best part about this season is you get to watch yourself every week and it's awful, but it causes you to improve and you realize, oh, that worked. Oh, and no, I've got to pull back on that. Okay, lean in a little bit more. Just have a bit more inflection in my voice. Go a little bit slower. So just looking at myself and watching myself like I was receiving it for the first time going, am I connecting? Am I disengaging? Well, oh, because I leaned in there, I leaned in watching it. Okay, I've got to do that at the right points and just a few things. Josh, you, you've become a tele-evangelist. <laughs> and it's true and you can have this gift too if you send two hundred dollars to zero four two two john um you're very experienced in uh in production your wife certainly is experienced in production as well um what are some of the techniques we can use as communicators looking down a camera to change 
so that rather than people watching us preach, they feel like we're preaching to them personally? Yeah, that's actually a really excellent question. Uh, and kind of leaning into what Josh was talking about before, uh, well, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things you can do is to become comfortable looking into a camera. So you're doing it actually right now, although some of you are just looking at the screen, some of you are looking at yourself on the screen. Uh, and, and, but one of the things you can do, which will be very, very helpful, is to practice looking at a camera. Just like people who want to preach in front of a, an audience, one of the things that I'll tell them to do is get up on a stage and practice or, or familiarize yourself with looking out into a sea of faces, uh, which kind of gets rid of a little bit of the fear maybe of, uh, of preaching in that kind of environment. Two things that you always want to think about as a communicator. I mean, there's many more things, but two things, especially at the moment, uh, who is your audience and what is their context? So who is your audience? Your audience is potentially the same, potentially far more people, a uh, different kind of demographic. Um, their context is radically different. So usually they'd be all together. Uh, and so something that I've noticed is nobody laughs at my jokes um, down a camera. Uh, you don't hear the amens. You, don't, you can't see, like Josh was saying, you've got to picture in your mind people leaning in when you're making a point or when you start to lean in and things like this. Uh, one of the things that I learned early days in radio is you need to have a picture in your mind of the person who you're speaking to. Uh, when I was in radio or, or in TV, again, you're, just, you're looking at a microphone, you're looking down the barrel of a camera. You have to have some sort of mind's eye of who is the person that you're speaking to, where are they, what is their context, and you want to speak to that person in their context. So for the people who to whom I'll be preaching on a Sunday, all I see is the handful of people around me. So we're live um, so that we can, I mean, there's pros and cons to all different kinds of things. Uh, we're live and people will meet either in Zooms um, to gather with their home groups or their like discipleship groups, their small groups with us. Uh, and they'll watch a screen together uh, while scattered. Um, or they're just watching on a phone or a tablet. Uh, they're watching in their beds. They're watching on a small screen. Some will be watching on a toilet. Some of you are watching in a lounge room. Um, some, like they would be watching from, I mean, literally anywhere really these days. And so we need to have a picture in our mind of how are they actually, uh, I don't want to make it too abstract, but how are they consuming this media? What we don't want is for them to be consuming it like they would consume Netflix. We don't want people passively consuming a sermon or a, uh, a worship gathering. We want them participating in the gathering. And so part of what we need to do is actually put ourselves in their context and so not the toilet part, obviously, but uh, I mean, it's awkward, as awkward as it sounds in their bedrooms with them, uh, in the lounge room with them. And so when you are, like Josh was saying, I, I, lo I love being a bit more energetic when I'm on a stage and when you get some feedback from people in terms of how engaged they are, uh, you don't get any of that. And so you have to put yourself into their context. So I'm imagining I am transported into a lounge room with a mum and a dad and two young kids and a baby for example and so i'm thinking i, I am like in my mind virtually transported into their lounge room and i'm, I'm trying to preach i'm trying to communicate i'm trying to speak to them uh, as if i am right there with them um so the jokes that i would use although i'm i mentioned jokes twice already i'm not a real like jokey person right uh the the illustrations I'll use, the tone of my voice, the volume of my voice will be markedly different from when I'm on a stage to when I'm preaching in their lounge room. So although I'm in a church building here, I am, again, in my mind, I'm preaching from their own lounge room in their lounge room to them. That's how I want to imagine my communication going through. John, the, the online services that I've watched, I've seen two very different styles. Some preachers style seen have themselves on stage in the auditorium and they're very deliberately trying to keep it like a church feel even the camera angles it, it, it's and, and even the way they present it's like they're preaching to a full auditorium then the other style i've seen is guys that have ditched that completely and and they've gone the real intimate route where they're preaching straight down the camera to you as if you're in your lounge room um, I want to go to your wife, Beck, who's very um, involved in production. Which of those two styles is best? What are the pros and cons? Uh, are we better to film church as if we're preaching to a huge auditorium 
where we better to ditch that, go more, if I can, the Josh Greenwood route, sit on a stool or, or Don's if they're in their toilet. Beck, can you speak to that? I can. I'm having some internet connectivity problems, but hopefully it'll be all right. Otherwise, I'll just jump in and meant to go with what's working for your church. So, um, whatever will help your church engage, I think is is the best approach to go with um, knowing the people in your congregation and how they will be meeting as well. Josh, what about you? What's what's your view on that? Look, I, I, I've I've talked to people about this, and I think generally the perspective, the, the position of I'm going to preach like I've always preached. I'm going to preach to the room like it always has because I don't want the church to change. Well, the truth is things have changed, and when things go back, let's work out what it looks like then. But to be honest, even when it goes back, I'm going to adjust some things with my preaching because I've realised that there is growth that can happen through this, and while this is we want to be with people. The reality is things have changed in this season. And, and, and preach to the room, but they're, they're not there. They're, they're looking straight down the camera. They're not looking from their usual seat, far left, far right, back row, middle. They've got a front and center view through that camera lens. So for me, and Beck is right, you're, what, what you feel the spirit saying to you, you've got to follow because that wins beyond logic, right? If you, and, and you've got to know the context of your environment. But for me, I, I, I want to have right now an intimate personal conversation. And I think this is what this opportunity affords. I feel my congregation will feel more personally connected to me through the most disconnected season we've ever had in the church when I talk to them like they're, like they're the only person in the room. And for me, when there's a high level of disconnection, I'm going to do anything to create personal connection. And that for me means looking straight down the camera. And while it's uncomfortable for me, and it's, it's a new learning and it's definitely growing. And I can tell you afterwards, I feel empty because there's no faith or emotional return. I feel a much more greater faith and emotional return when I get moving and doing my usual practice, but probably because that has rhythm and familiarity and this is different. So it's uncomfortable, but if it creates intimacy and connection with the person on the other side, that is what is most valuable in this season. I think. Let, let me bring up the, the issue of attention. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got people in the room, you, you, you know, we used to say you've got to grab people's attention at the beginning of a sermon. Well, the fact is you've got to grab people's attention at the beginning and then you've got to grab it again and again and again and again because we have such short attention spans. Um, even more of a challenge now, because I'm watching, uh, in my case, Hillsong at home, but while Brian's preaching, I'm getting a cup of tea. Um, my kids are yahooing around the house. Um, I, I'm checking Twitter, um, because I can do that, because no one is going to look poorly at me, because no one knows. So uh, how do we maintain people's attention in this season? where their attention is more divided than ever. And I want to ask this on two levels. Um, firstly, from a communication style point of view, and secondly, from a technical point of view. Uh, by technical, I mean, what are the camera angles? What are the production values that can help to maintain people's attention? So I want to hit it from two angles, the way that we communicate and the way that we produce um, the broadcast. Um, I'll open that up to, to all three of you. Don, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can speak to that. Um, so there, uh, one of the more recent kind of styles, which I've really enjoyed uh, when people are live streaming a regular gathering where people can meet together is putting the camera as if it's in the seat so that you're actually transporting the viewer, the person who is at home or whatever, into the audience, like into the congregation. Um, but we're really doing the opposite of that now. And so before you'd have it uh, from like low, a lower angle. So traditionally you'd have like multi-point, uh, boom, or a whole bunch of different kinds of things like this. And that still is the case in many churches. Uh, and transporting down to that, having a couple of camera angles, but more from the perspective of the congregation, like the, the people in the, in the crowd, if you like, uh, to what we have done is we're just going one single camera because again, 
uh, we are now transporting ourselves into their context, not trying to bring them into our context. And so it's, it's the inverse of what we used to do. And so what we've done is we've just gone for one, uh, the highest quality camera we can get where everybody is basically either staring down the barrel or if you were in somebody's house, you wouldn't just be staring at them all the time. And so that's your point of reference, if you like, for where your audience or, or your participants are situated, but you still want to be able to like look around the room a little bit as if you were in the room with them. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest things. And you can do this with a good quality camera phone all the way up to broadcast technology. So um, uh, we, we have done, basically we've, in, we've iterated all the way from the very first week before the restrictions came in, we already had some of our vulnerable people, vulnerable people who were staying home. And so we literally broadcast from a, uh, a laptop uh, for, the, for one of our gatherings and then an iPhone for another gathering just to try some different things. Um, and then the following week, we went to a broadcast camera and every week basically we've bought more gear to now where we have qu quite a professional um, like production studio, really. Uh, but you can do that with very, very small uh, technical equipment. Um, you, you, the budget of a few hundred dollars all the way up to 10, 15, 20,000 dollars um, you're going to see incremental benefit along the way. Um, but that again, that, the philosophy or ideology of how do you want to actually um, incorporate the people who are watching into your services, into your gatherings. Uh, our philosophy is we want to go to where they are rather than trying to put them into where we're at. I, I think that's a great point. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking as you speak is you can't really get it wrong in this season because no one knows what's right. So it really is a great season of experimentation and uh, there's no reason why the guy with uh, a million dollars of broadcast equipment is necessarily going to be more effective than a, a really cheap piece of equipment out in a small town somewhere because we're, we're all trying different things, just trying to see what, what works. Beck, talk to me about close-ups and... Um, far shots in terms of creating intimacy and uh, getting attention for people. Do, do preachers need to think about this and, and how do we advise our production crews about how we want to be filmed? Um, does it make a difference? Well, again, I think it's like, you know, each church is different. I was just going to say what you were talking about just before. Um, also, just making sure that you're not trying to just replicate a different church to make sure that you're doing something that's genuine for who you are as a church family and to not like look at other people's production quality and be discouraged, but to know that um, in this time, this is a great opportunity for a church to draw, draw closer together and to embrace the skills and abilities that you have to laugh about the things that you don't necessarily have in the bag yet and, um, and go with your strengths and not sort of try and replicate something a $20,000 budget on a $200 budget. Um, as far as shots, I mean, as Don was saying, we sort of stick with the one camera and I think we really rely on the um, pastor, the preacher to engage and to create those different dynamics um, during a, like a live sermon. I guess if we are assuming that someone's watching it on a bigger screen, we want to have a, a torso up with a little bit of headroom um, kind of perspective to, again, put it as if that person is in the room. And so what we want to do is we want to find out how are um, most of our people engaging with uh, the, the gathering of the broadcast. It's so difficult to talk about it. You know, what do we actually even call it? Is it a live stream? Is it a broadcast? Is it whatever? Uh, we want to use that gathering terminology because like Josh was saying earlier, uh, we don't want to just like put out content. We actually want to gather together as the church. Uh, and so the more we can do to make it as if we're, that's basically, we'll, we'll orient all of our production to that end. Talk to me about humour. Uh, Josh, I, I've preached down the barrel of a camera with no one present. And to try to be funny with no one there, I mean, it, trying to be funny is difficult at the best of times. You do it naturally. We just look at you and laugh. But, but have you stopped using jokes because it's impossible to know whether it gets a good response or are you still using jokes and how do you, how are you using humor in your messages, if at all? Yeah, look, totally. And I, I think I'm hilarious. And, uh, and the truth is 
I, as I'm filming it, to be honest, I haven't got anyone else in the room but my production guy, and he's not laughing. And um, so, but uh, I, 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 I think it's still important because, well, here's the deal. If you didn't use humor before, don't try and do it through a camera. But if you used humor before, if you're a little bit cheeky and, and, and it's in your nature to make a joke about that suit, you can do that. And, and, and just, you know, and you just allow that glimmer in your eye to be seen and, and to have a little smirk and a smile, but you, you're not going to pause and wait for the reaction, but you've got to be you. And I find what I've probably moved to where I've sometimes got more deliberate jokes or as you're engaging with it, a lot of humor comes from engaging with the crowd and you notice things and you realize, oh, that was accidentally funny. Let's hang there for a moment. I'm finding, for lack of a better word, cute stories. I'm using a little bit more. And I'm talking about just little observations and things and having that little bit of flow through through that. I find that's in there. Um, you, you're exactly right. People are on Twitter and they're going to the microwave or they're going to the kettle or they're going to the bathroom. Um, so those moments almost allow you're thinking through your message. Where am I having these brain breaks? And we're, we're taught to have that in a, in, a, in a longer message. Now they've just got to be a touch more regular. You got to choose your choose your moments and choose your points. Um, I find I'm just deliberately trying to change tone through my message. I've I'm almost reading through what I'm saying before and going, where am I trying to connect with the person? Where where do I feel there's a there's a grace and an anointing because my message is coming together. I'm choosing where honestly before I preach it and I'm also sensing it while I'm preaching. But where's my lean in point? I, I found myself last week I tried something. That as I was getting to a scripture at the end that brought it all together. And it was, wait, wait for the Lord to appear. And I just said, wait. Now, come on, say it with me. Wait for the Lord to appear. Now, because I'm running this on Zoom, I've pre-recorded it on Thursday. And now I'm watching it with my Zoom group on Sunday. I was curious. But when I said that, I saw every person look up and go, wait for the Lord to appear. So the thing is, that there's, there's, it sounds horrible. What do we do with children that we're trying to keep their attention? We tell some stories, we lean in, we get at their level, we have little brain breaks, there's points of authority and connection, and we get them to repeat and engage. And not that we wanted to call our congregation children, but they are distracted like children, and, and their attention span is going to be shorter like children. And so we're, we're not minimizing the scripture, but we're thinking, how do I engage with someone that's going to be distracted in this? And, and You've got to be you in that. Um, I'm certainly finding tones changing and everything around it, but I'm trying to think through my message. Where's my engagement points? Where's my, so partway through, I'll say, hey, let me just tell you a story for a moment. And again, the beauty of what we're doing is on Zoom, you can see as that happens, heads go up. Uh, hey, you need to get this point for a second. Church, just lean in with me. And, and again, I just accidentally do it, but you lean in with, and, and you just see people go, okay. So you're just looking for that moment to re-engage. You know, um, something you said there really strikes me as quite powerful, where you're asking people to make a physical response. One of the things I used to find was I, I just want people to be watching me on screen as if they were at the movies. I, I need them engaged. And I think Jesus used this method. I mean, being baptized in water. It's kind of a pointless thing, really. There's no magic in the water. It's, it's annoying. It's inconvenient. Um, it can be downright embarrassing. But, but there's something to be said for physically engaging in order to um, get our focus. And, and so one of the things I used to do is at the beginning of a message, I would ask people to do something physically, whether it's we're going to pray, but as we pray, why don't you put your hand on your heart or wherever you are right now, what, what, I want you to stand up, even if you're in your lounge room, just, just stand up for one moment We're gonna, or, or whatever, but get them to physically respond so that they snap out of I'm watching a movie kind of mode or I'm watching TV to I'm actually engaging with you as you talk via the screen. I think that can be a really powerful technique for getting people to be with you rather than simply passively watching. So can I just, just to add to that, just because, again, it depends on how everyone's doing it. Sometimes we don't do that because we think no one's going to do it. I'm watching people do it. So when, we, uh, when I pray at the end, I'm often, okay, where you are, just stretch your hands in front of you like you're about to receive. 
And it's, it's in, intentional. Like less in church now we say, shut your eyes and bow your heads. But in this season, like just why don't you shut your eyes for a moment and put your, when we're praying for needs, we're making a point every service we're praying for needs. So it's okay. If you're struggling in the mind right now, just put your hand where your mind is. If you have a need in your body, put your hand and, and that. And, and again, I think people are wanting to engage and connect because this is what's beautiful about the season. If they don't want to come to church, they don't have to. So the ones that are coming on actually want to engage with the word and the power of God. So don't be afraid to do exactly what Pastor James is saying there to get them to physically respond because you've already got them in the room. You've already got them there. So you might as well get them to engage as much as I, I want to talk about this aspect, um, pre-recorded versus live. And, and I think between you, Josh, and Don, we've got two different styles here. If I'm hearing correctly, Josh is pre-recording his messages. That's because he requires 20 attempts to get it right. And, um, and Don is going live. Um, so maybe I'll go to Don. Why are you going live versus pre-record? And then I want to go to Josh and find out why you're doing the opposite. Talk to me about that. Yeah. So well, we're not anti-pre-record. So um, three of our churches are pre-recording. We are going live uh, at the one here in Glenelg. And uh, the, one of the main reasons we wanted to do that was for the intimacy and the immediacy of being live. Uh, where we do have people who are meeting in groups together. So in the first couple of weeks, people would gather in homes to watch or participate in the live streams. Then we went to Zoom gatherings. So our home groups would meet in, um, in those Zoom gatherings and then watch together. And, and they're still doing that uh, because we want people to be able to like, be there with each other. You can still do that, obviously, with a pre-record. Uh, we were hoping that we'd be able to interact with people like, on the live stream. So people are commenting on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, or on our website and we can actually interact with people in that dynamic kind of way um, also just there there is for us that a uh, slight psychological thing of well ev everybody is going to be here now we're finding with the uh, our other churches the city light churches that are pre-recording some will watch it at 10 o'clock or at five o'clock or um, 10 30 whenever they are going live um, or whenever they're, they're you know premiering but uh, others are saying well it's not really live, so we'll watch it later or we'll participate later. And for some, they need to because they're working or, uh, you know, sick potentially they can't actually participate. And, and that's one of the real positives of our current kind of situation is that people can actually um, kind of interact with church, if you like, when they're able to. And if they're not able to in a regular way, they can still participate. Um, but that's, that was the main reason. So, again, we're not, we're not anti one way or the other, but that was our main reason. We wanted to have that, the, the immediacy of, oh, this is actually happening right now uh, somewhere in the world even though we can't gather we are gathered or those scattered it's awesome very good josh you're yeah. pretty cool yeah I, look i've got two reasons again no issue with with live um but my two reasons are i've got different campuses that have different service times and i want to keep people in the same service time rhythm for when church goes back so uh four out of our six campuses run nine and eleven the two that run only one service on Sunday morning run a 10. I want to keep them at the same time. That's probably my secondary reason. Here's my unique reason I pre-record. Because we're doing it via Zoom, the host shares their screen and shows the service. Because the bandwidth in Australia is not amazing, I've got to download a service and upload a service at the same time. If I'm receiving the service live, and I'm then sending the service to all the participants, I'm wanting to minimize the chance of any glitches or not receiving the service as smooth as I can. So by Friday, we have a thing, Friday at three o'clock, every Zoom host, and we've got, you know, there's 370 Zoom hosts that are running services, multiple services on a weekend. They are all receiving at three o'clock the service. They download it to their computer, it's saved there so when it comes to the service time whatever service time it is they have the ability to merely share their screen and they're not downloading and uploading that's to be honest that was my primary thing to go if this is glitchy it's not going to be great because we're doing it via zoom and that's the unique that's the uniqueness of our thing but also the service time but to be honest on every sunday i wish i was doing it live like you know because sunday in your mind's church and that feeling of we're all gathering and doing it. And on Tuesday, we do our worship Tuesday and our preach Thursday. 
Tuesday, it is difficult to sometimes get the team in that spiritual space ready for worship. So there are complications to doing it before, mostly because of rhythm and pattern. Um, but yeah, they're the reasons why we do it pre-recorded. There are pros and cons. Like uh, the pro of doing pre-recorded is you can make your music sound a lot better. And so that could be uh, like there, there is a kind of a, a saying in broadcasting, if you like that, people will forgive bad video, uh, but they can't hack bad audio. And so if you can't broadcast your, your music in particular well live, then you should not, I, I don't think you should do it. Although the flip side of that is being live, there's more grace for mistakes and just okay. mishap and a few like technological issues. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add, because I think Don's on something really great there. Uh, these are two tensions. We have the ability, if there was something awful in pitch, to be able to adjust it before we send it to our hosts. Absolutely. But we make sure our worship recording and our preach is one take. Because if there's a stutter or a mistake, we're going to make those stutters or mistakes on Sunday. We don't, we're not looking for perfect. We're not looking for church that's, okay, you go and watch an album recording that has been edited a thousand times before anyone's seen it. We want to keep church being church. And that's going to have someone's going to come in a little bit early or I'm going to try to remember where I was or stutter over a word or whatever. There's no retakes, restarts. I, I genuinely feel if you're going to pre-record, make it just like you were doing it live and it's one, one set of worship and one preach. I, I disagree with that, Josh. I think record over and over and over again until you really do sound like Jensen Franklin. <laughs> No, wise. Um, what about this dichotomy? Um, because we're now recording uh, scripted using a teleprompter or still preaching extemporaneously, what's, what's the word? Um, preaching off the cuff. See, if we pre recorded this, I would have edited that out. And, uh, and got the word right. So that's why I'm a fan of pre-recording. Um, are either of you preaching from a script now that you can because no one can see you've got a script there in front of you? Uh, are you have you turned into Obama with teleprompters there? Uh, or are you still preaching very much um, off the cuff with minimal notes? Yeah, well, usually uh, I'll preach not really to my notes. Uh, and I think that that will all come down to how how comfortable, how familiar you are preaching to a camera. So if you can ad lib, so usually on a Sunday, uh, anywhere between a quarter and half of my preach will be stuff that's not necessarily prepared, um, you know, on the day. So when I like chase down ideas that come, or if someone, if people are reacting in a particularly like a good way, or seem interested in something. Um, that I might say off the cuff, I might chase that down a little bit. So I'll still do that. But, I, but I've been doing that for like 15 years in radio, three hours a day, uh, you know, with 15, 20 minutes of that being critiqued after, the, um, after that session every single day. And so that's something that I, I have been able to do and, and grow in doing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how I'd go. I think it'd be more difficult for me to go to a script or trying to preach off a teleprompter now. Yeah, for, for me, I, I love this as a contrast. I, I, when I prepare my messages, I prepare them in full, written out word for word. And for some reason, that gives me comfort to not read my message word for word when I go to preach it. So I can somewhat remember what I've written and where it is on the page and where it is. So just a glance allows me to know where I'm going because I want to be able to know where I'm going and what I'm intentionally trying to do to then be able to flow that actually some people are limited by having almost the script for me, it's free. So then when I come to preaching to the camera, I actually have the whole thing on a teleprompter or a plasma right above the camera. So I'm looking at the camera, but again, because I can remember what I've written and where it is in the page. And that's just how it works in my brain. I have the ability to have that flow and I have someone that, um, that is literally listening to my message and following along and they're having to work out where is he? Cause I will go off that script. And if they get it wrong, they're fired forever out of the kingdom of God. We've lost two people. So we hope this doesn't go too much longer, but they're following along with the, 
with the script or the message and it's there if I want it. And if there's an important part I want to get right, I've got it right there and I'm not losing my part, but, but, but I'm not trying to read it. And I found week two, I think it was, I was exploring something. I was trying to get myself and I found myself for the safety of my notes looking too much. And I had to pull myself to be in that camera because you don't want to be reading something. But for me, having it there allows me to know where I'm going next. But that's just more how my brain works than it is the right thing to do. So really, what, where both of those come together is you want to be prepared. So as prepared as you, you need to be uh, and as comfortable with the medium as you need to be. Yeah. I, I'm more your style, Josh. I used to write my messages out in full, um, but in Greek. <laughs> You're so smart, James. <laughs> what can I say? Um, let me ask you this question. Um, preaching for broadcast, has it changed the length of time that you're preaching? Um, if I were to jump in, totally. Uh, without a doubt. We were probably uh, 35, 30 and 5 was roughly our guide for a preach on a Sunday. 30 minute message, 5 minute uh, um, altar call response time, etc. I'm preaching 20 minutes now. I'm, I'm, I'm maxing out if I'm going to 23, 24 minutes, just because the engagement is less. And um, uh, someone just put a question in there, by the way, putting scriptures on screen. We are putting, we have pre-given all our scriptures and they're put as lower thirds on the screen so people can read and follow along. Uh, there is the ability to do that, but yeah, 20 minutes. And it, what's, what's incredible is when I go back, I don't think I'm gonna be preaching the same length I was before. And because you just realize I can, one of the things I'm realizing this season is the church is very resilient and we've got time. And sometimes I'm trying to do everything on one Sunday when maybe people will take more in by not having to do everything and looking at the church over years and seasons rather than individual weeks, because this week's got to be a home run. And I'm realizing now in COVID, we're less going for the home run. and We just want people to check in. Like if people are coming on the service, thank you, Jesus. And let's be real. If they're giving, thank you, Jesus. Like, you know, it's quite simple at the moment so it's actually made me take the pressure off having to have the greatest sermon every week but to connect intimately to get this thought across knowing you know what we're going to be back doing this again next week and i just wish i realized it before so i don't know how long i'll preach when i go back but i think it will be shorter because i am preaching shorter now that's me yes yeah, same we were 42 minutes was our goal so anything from 40 to 45 was the regular and we're down to 20 to 25 for very similar reasons I think um, you naturally preach shorter when there's no crowd because as Josh mentioned earlier, there's not that interaction where you start going down a train of thought or down a track because you're getting a response from a live audience. Uh, when you're speaking direct to camera, you really do stay on script, whether it's scripted word for word or simply the script in your mind, but there's, there's less distraction as a speaker and so you tend to be more concise anyway, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the great things to work out how long, because this is, and when you begin doing it, and if you're about to go into doing it, I know some people on here saying, this is coming up for me and I'm practicing. You can literally, I just, my wife's preaching Sunday. So first time she's doing it via this means. So I just told her, get on a stool and get, turn Zoom on and record yourself preaching to camera on Zoom. And that way, because you preach in front of a mirror, it is different to when you're preaching to a camera and you can watch yourself. It does two things. It lets you know how long it's going to go because you've literally recorded it and you get to watch your mannerisms and how you do it. And, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I have the teleprompter is because every time I look down at my iPad, you can see the top of my head. So I'm trying to look forward. So that way, when you're doing it on Zoom, you're realizing how often am I down? How often do I look off screen? It is a great way to work out both timing and mannerisms. Some of us are jealous of the top of your head, Josh. There's hair. <laughs> it's a wig. <laughs> You're looking good. All right, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Maybe final thoughts. Um, what's, what's been the, the biggest thing you've learned as a communicator and a preacher um, in this season? If, there, if there's one thing that you, you, you thought, because both of you have been preaching for a while, but uh, if there's one thing that you've learned that you never realized, but it's really helped you in this season, thought?
Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, I think that the one of the biggest things that I have, I mean, really had reinforced to me or learning in a new way is that uh, as important as the preaching is, if it's not, if that kind of vision and the passion for scripture and uh, for the will of God and for the Holy Spirit isn't carried through the whole church, uh, you can have like one really amazing communicator speaking, you know, in a broadcast sense, but if there's no community really to drive that in and, and embody the message, like embody what we're learning, uh, then for me, I'm thinking there's, there's not a, there's some point, but there's not a great amount of, of point. Uh, what we want to have is uh, when, when we're considering, even though we have many more people engaging in our preaching than we have ever before, really, or at least in terms of life, um, how is it actually being outworked on the ground? What effect and what effect is that happening in the people who call our church home and your church home? What does it look like? And I mean, really, that will inform or even dictate all of the other things we've talked about. So should you just meet on Zoom and not actually live stream somewhere? Or should you only live stream? Or should you only meet in smaller um, gatherings and, and disseminate a uh, video? Or all those kinds of things will come down to how, what's it actually look like? How's it being embodied in your people? Uh, and for me, that's been a very encouraging thing to see that, uh, I mean, the, I love a, like a pulpit driven church uh, can be really good because it really makes us centered around the word, around scripture. Uh, but at the same time, it's great to be able to see maybe how the church can go really well, even not, not without us, not without preaching, uh, but by taking that preaching, actually putting the legs on it, putting the meat on those bones, uh, putting it to work in our working God's kind of plan in our church. Um, so that, that for me has really been a stark thing that our Sundays are important, um, but at least as important is what does the body look like? How's, what's the health of the body um, in the other seven days of the week? That's it. He's outstanding. Um, real quick, two things I've, I've, I've learned in this season is one, I can just adapt and grow. And this has forced me to review how I do things and, not that there was a problem before, but I can be better and I can be different and I can grow. And the last thing is the church is so strong. And sometimes as preachers, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. This is going to be so perfect because the future of the church and the success of how we're going depends on this preach. And then COVID-19 hits and we can't gather and we can't do things like we used to and the church is okay. And I think the best thing we can take out of this is that it's his bride and he grows his church and while I adapt and we adapt and we're all doing this right now, it's all going to be all right. And I just hope when I go back to preaching how we usually did, I enjoy it more. I notice the people more make more room for God to speak and just take some of the weight off my preach and more weight on that. He's going to do what he's going to do. Very good. Hey, uh, Beck and Don and Josh. I'm sure everyone else has appreciated what you've shared. Um, I certainly have. My, my only problem from all of this is on Sunday, I don't know which church I want to go to now, whether I want to go to Josh's or Don's. I'm intrigued by both. The good thing in this season, you can go to a different church and no one knows. It's true. I'm going to hand back to Matt. Matt, you can advise us uh, what we're doing now. Thanks, guys. Thanks everybody. That's a, a brilliant session. For all our participants today, it's not over yet. What we're going to do is we're going to automatically allocate you to a room with James, Don and Beck and Josh, and you can have further conversations there about what's going on. It will only last for 10 minutes. And then at the end of that 10 minutes, we will be finished and moving on. So once again, thank you for taking the time of being with us today. Um, we are very hopeful that this has made a difference and we know that it has. And so for the next 10 minutes, you can now ask Q&A direct of James, Don and Beck and Josh. And Beck's going to move you into those rooms. Thanks, guys. Thank you making the time to be with us from wherever you are during the day. Um, we will send out a follow-up email with the recording of today, like I said earlier, and also just a, a short uh, survey just asking for some feedback and some ideas of future webinars that you might be interested in. Um, but as always, stay connected, find each other on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and 
um, have a look at the names here and, and stay connected that way because we are the body of Christ all trying to make a difference here and uh, impact people's lives. Once again, um, as Alpha Crucis, we're here to uh, build you up in your calling and where God's leading you to. And so we are more than happy to help in any way that we possibly can. So let's pray quickly and we'll let you on for the rest of your day. Father, we thank you for every person here today. We thank you for the effort that they're making in building your kingdom across the earth. And we thank you that you've called us and that you were equipping us during this time to continue to grow your kingdom despite what the challenges may be. We pray for your blessing upon everybody here and awesome and we pray. Amen. Thanks again, James, Josh, Beck and Don. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.